everyone it's Sophie G and welcome to my channel today I'm going to be talking about the books that I read in January February and March of 2020 not all the videos on my channel are going to be about reading but I do love to read so if this does interest you then please feel free if you want to like and subscribe and also um, follow me on Goodreads which I will link in the bio so if I have the book with me, I will show it, but a lot of the books are from the library, so I don't have them. But I'll insert a, insert a picture, because um, it's nice to have something to look at. Also, I have rated all of the books that I read, and I'll just give you kind of an idea of my rating system. It's mostly just based off, you know, the feeling I get. <laughs> but um, basically, if I rate it five stars, then pretty much perfect. Really enjoyed it, didn't have any major issues with it. Four stars, good, enjoyed it, or felt that it had a lot of merit in some way, but it, it just wasn't perfect to me. I didn't love it, I guess. Three stars is like, it's okay, I had some issues with it, but I didn't, didn't hate it, didn't not enjoy reading it, it was just kind of average. Two stars, I did have quite a few issues or things that I didn't like about it but I, I didn't absolutely hate it and then one star I haven't rated any of the books I've read one star so far but that would be pretty much I had a lot of issues with it or I just hated it <laughs> pretty much pretty self-explanatory sort of rating system but just thought I'd let you know my my thought process a little bit there so the first book that I read this year was called Wild Woman by Sue Thomas. I do actually own this book but I have absolutely no idea where it is. So sorry, don't have it today. I've got notes here by the way, which is why I'm looking off to the side of it. This book is a collection of short stories written by women that celebrate various manifestations of the wild woman who has been civilized out of many women in today's society. To that description of Goodreads, by the way. So this concept of the wild woman that it talks about in the book is um, based off the idea of a wild woman from another book, which is called Woman Who Run With The Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman, Archetype, which was written by Clarissa Pincola Estes. So in Estes' book, she pretty much says that Within every woman there is a wild and natural creature, a powerful force filled with good instincts, passionate creativity and ageless knowing. And her aim in the book is to restore the hidden vitality um, by sharing multicultural myths, fairy tales, folk tales and stories. The short stories in this book were sort of divided into thematic sections. They covered things like family duties, relationships, sex, abuse, just to name a few of the things. So the collection had a total of 47 stories, I think it is. And because of the fact that there's so many stories by a lot of diverse, different sort of authors and themes and things like that, I found that there were some stories that I really connected with and I really enjoyed the writing style and found really engaging. But on the other hand, there were also a lot that I, I didn't connect with at all, that um, the writing style was just not for me, particularly because there were quite a few stories that weren't written in a very conventional style and I just didn't enjoy them as much. I feel like this is a pretty typical reaction for me when it comes to short stories because when there's a lot of different stories you don't, you don't necessarily vibe <laughs> with all of them or find them very engaging, that's just the way it is for me, particularly because there's a lot of different authors. So basically I, I gave this three star rating because there was quite a large disparity for me in the ones that I, there was some that I really loved and some that I, that I just hated pretty much. I can think of one that I really loved and one that I really hated but I can't tell you what they are because I don't have the book. I'd also really like to read the book that this book is sort of based on, the one by Clarissa Pincola Estes. It would be good to understand more about the context and like her sort of research because she is, um, she's got a PhD in some sort of area <laughs> related to that. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Even though I've kind of given it a pretty average rating, I definitely would recommend it 
because there are some great things in there and you know everyone likes different things like the stories that I didn't like are probably amazing to some people and yeah particularly if you're interested in like feminist topics because that's very much what this collection is about. So the second book that I've read is one that I actually do have here. It's called Fred and Edie by Jill Dawson. This novel's based off the story of a true crime that happened in England in I believe the early 1920s. So a woman, Edith Thompson, and her younger lover, Freddie, Freddie Bywaters, were convicted of murdering Edith's husband. So the novel takes the form of um, imaginary letters sent from Edie to Freddie from um, in jail where she's um, awaiting basically whether she's going to be um, executed or not but it also kind of jumps into flashbacks what the events leading up to the crime as well so that's really good that it provides context for what she's talking about in the letters even though we see the letters first it's a bit like oh what happened and then you get shown what happened. I did enjoy like the narrative of this novel and found it quite engaging but I didn't entirely love the the parts that were written in an imaginary letter style. I just found that they dragged a bit and they were super focused on the way Edie was feeling rather than like there was no action happening which I just didn't find that engaging. It's just a bit repetitive explaining how she felt, you know? Yeah, but I really enjoyed the sort of flashback sections. They weren't written like flashbacks, but you know, they were explaining things that had happened in the past, which were in more of a third person sort of style from what I can remember. Because yeah, they, they explained what was going on, which was interesting to me. I also think that Dawson Jill Dawson did a really good job of um, creating empathy for the Edie character and she sort of revealed it in a really nice way where I found at the start it sort of seemed like Edie was more of a villain but it slowly was revealed that um, she was more of the victim in the situation and I thought that was really well done. So I did rate this four stars because for the most part I found it quite engaging but yeah, the imaginary letter style just wasn't really my thing. Definitely like to look more into the the actual real life crime that this was based off because it seems like it was a pretty big thing at the time and yeah, I like true crime, so. Then I read Miss Brill by Catherine Mansfield. I was actually gifted this by my year 13 English teacher because um, we studied Miss Brill in class then. So that's cute. If you don't know who Catherine Mansfield is, she's a uh, early 20th century, I think. That's like 19, 1900s, right? I don't know. I'm kind of stupid like that. From New Zealand, this little book here is a collection of three of her stories, which are Mariage a la Mode, Miss Brill, and The Stranger. I have not read Catherine Mansfield since high school, and I I don't know if I've read anything other than Miss Brill before this and I don't remember being particularly engaged or interested by the work but you know when you study something in high school sometimes it can be a little bit like that you know but I actually loved all three of these stories. Catherine Mansfield is very good at commenting on the sort of social pitfalls I guess of her contemporary society which is what I feel like all of the um, stories in this collection do. Yeah, I really felt a lot of empathy for the characters in all of these stories and they made me feel a lot of things. It was like after I finished reading it, you know, when you read something really gets you emotionally, you're like, oh, it's like cathartic almost. I really felt that way when I finished reading this. So I in fact rated this five stars. Really, really enjoyed it. Next we have Howl and Other Poems by Ellen Ginsberg. So if you don't know, this is a collection of um, poems by 1950s beat 
Generation Poet Allen Ginsberg. This includes which, what is probably his most famous um, poem, Howl. I actually studied Howl for um, an English paper I took a couple of years ago, which is why I have this collection. The paper was called Controversial Classics because there's a lot of controversy and history around this poem, which I'm not going to go into because it would take a long time. But yeah, it's really interesting. You should um, look into it if you are going to read this because I think it is quite um, helpful and kind of important to understand a lot of the socio-political historical context of Beat Generation poetry. I definitely find that it helps me comprehend it a lot more. Yeah, so like I said, the poem is very much influenced by the socio-political context of 1950s America. This is 1950s, I think. Yeah, 1956. And I definitely don't have a huge understanding of that. Um, the paper I took was a while ago and we were studying lots of different topics so we can delve too deeply into it but I think that definitely helps me to engage with this poem a lot more. So the style of Ginsberg's poetry, particularly Howl, is very like densely descriptive. For example in Howl he kind of explains well, it explains, describes the sort of depraved underbelly of 1950s America. And this creates, like, amazing imagery, but I personally find it kind of difficult to read. Not in that it's, um, like, offensive or anything, but just to sort of comprehend. I find it a little bit difficult sometimes. That's how I often feel with, like, intensely descriptive literature but I know that there's a lot of people who find it to be the complete opposite so possibly that's just me. Also I don't read a lot of poetry, mostly like to read novels so I'm not super good at analysing poetry I don't think which also takes me away from engaging a little bit. I guess I like to analyse a lot as I go and if I can't analyze it readily I'm a bit like taken out of it I guess I don't know how to describe it I want to be smart when I read and sometimes poetry makes me feel like I'm not smart enough to understand you know so I rated it four stars very interesting start clean all that great imagery but definitely a challenge for me personally inspired by how and wanting to understand more or learn more about the Beat Generation, I read Naked Lunch by, uh, who's it by? William S. Burroughs. So this wasn't the first William S. Burroughs novel that I read. I have read Junkie. I actually have it in my shelf. And they're kind of about similar themes of heroin addiction, but Junkie is a lot and I mean a lot more uh, coherent. I mean, Junkie, for, for one thing, actually has a narrative. Naked Lunch does not really have that. Naked Lunch is basically, according to Goodreads, a series of loosely connected vignettes. And what I can gather from the writings that uh, accompany the, the main part of the book in the restored text is the vignettes were written while Burroughs was under the influence of drugs, namely heroin, but if not then they're very heavily in influenced by drug induced experiences. That context is pretty important I think because if you didn't know that it would kind of just seem like nonsense. For me I think I sort of view it as a writer sort of processing and reacting to life through an altered perception which I think does have some merit. I'm not one to say that like art written on drugs is like kind of better. You know some people think that doing drugs makes art better I guess. I don't think when you do drugs you necessarily become an amazing artist but 
it is interesting to see someone who is already quite a visionary writer process their thoughts while under the influence. I don't know if that makes sense. So, like how Naked Lunch is densely descriptive, I would say even more so. And this description is pretty gruesome, horrifying, um, in relation to very taboo topics. I found that in some sections of this description I was like totally immersed and like seeing everything in my mind's eye but then in other sections I was completely like what's going on? You know? <laughs> so I did actually rate it four stars because I found it incredibly challenging to read but I also think artistically it has a lot of merit. Next, uh, inspired by Miss Brill, I read New Zealand Stories by Catherine Mansfield, um, which is a collection of Mansfield's short stories that are set in New Zealand. I don't think these stories are Mansfield's best stories by any means. For the most part, I really was not interested or engaged by these stories in the same way that I was by the earlier collection of stories that I read by Catherine Mansfield, which were obviously a collection of her more um, well-known or well-loved and appreciated works, so that kind of makes sense. Yeah, as with other short story collections, some of them are really good and some of them you just, you just don't connect with. I did particularly, however, enjoy hearing descriptions of um, New Zealand from that time in history just because I'm from New Zealand it's kind of interesting to hear about places that you know in a very um, different sort of historical context. Yeah basically I rated it three stars because it wasn't one the best short story collection I've ever read it was just kind of average. If you've never read Catherine Mansfield stories. That's probably not the collection that I would pick up first, but I don't think anyone would anyway. I just kind of randomly found it in the library and I was like, oh yes, more Catherine Mansfield stories. The next book I read is called Killing Rachel by Anne Cassidy. Don't have a lot to say about this book. I pretty much just picked it up as like a light-hearted, easy-going sort of filler book because I've been reading a lot of quite intense literature and I just wanted to not have to think about anything too much while I read. And I was inspired by the fact that um, when I was in, in intermediate around the ages of 12-ish I remember reading Anne Cassidy books and really enjoying them so I just kind of picked up one of the few that they had at the library. <laughs> Don't think this is one of her good books. I'm pretty sure she has better books than this. I remember her books being better than this but I was also 12 so who knows. The characters and the writing style was just like bland. The narrative wasn't that original or engaging but I didn't hate it. I was I was mildly entertained and I didn't have to think too hard about anything so I did give it two stars and I think I might be wrong but I'm pretty sure that Anne Cassidy has books that are a lot better than this so don't read this one. <laughs> Sorry if this is your favourite book. What? So the next book is actually a collection of two plays. The collection is called The Memory Plays by Paula Vogel. Yeah, Paula Vogel. So the two plays in this collection are How I Learned to Drive and The Miniola Twins. So I was actually given How I Learned to Drive as an assigned reading for my playwriting and the f main theme of this play is sort of familial sexual abuse, I would say. How I Learned to Drive was definitely the better play of the two in the collection, in my opinion. I think the play does a really good job of um, quite accurately and um, delicately exploring the, the circumstances around a situation like that and sort of the psychology behind the people involved in that sort of situation but at the same time it was in a quite non-naturalistic narrative style. The way um, the 
sort of information around the situation in the play is revealed is also very effective and overall I just found the play very engaging. The Miniola Twins is a political satire that follows the lives of a set of twins, <laughs> two twins, who um, have kind of opposite perspectives on life and this is kind of across several decades in American history so sort of like the archetypal political perspectives from like the 50s, 70s, 80s I think that might be the three I'm not sure. This play was also very well written and engaging but to me not as engaging as How I Learned to Drive. It was definitely a fun read though and I think it's a great satire of American politics over the years. A lot of um, content for satire within American politics, I think we can all agree. So I rated this collection four stars because the second play wasn't as strong as the first. I definitely would have given How I Learned to Drive five stars if it was on its own. Because we're in lockdown, I haven't been able to return some of my library books that I've used, so I don't I hope I don't get charged for those. I probably won't. That would be kind of shitty. This next book is Louise Nicholas, the Louis <laughs> What is it called? Louise Nicholas, my story by Louise Nicholas is about Louise Nicholas, funnily enough. Who is a woman who became well known in New Zealand because she, from when she was a young teenager up until she was an adult in her 20s was raped and sexually assaulted by members of the New Zealand police force. This turned into a very public trial, obviously a hugely scandalous and horrifying situation. The book is written partially by Louise Nicholas and also partially by, what's his name, Philip Kitchen, who was a journalist whose investigation led Louise's case to be taken to trial. Pretty much what you discover from the book is the situation Louise was in was incredibly poorly handled and was pretty much they tried to cover it up. It's pretty baffling to see how, well not even baffling, like it's not even that surprising but it's just frustrating isn't even the right word, just like disgusting to see that people in power can just decide that they don't get in trouble you know and their friends they don't get in trouble either you know it's it's a very important story because it, it pretty much highlights how poorly handled rape accusations are how victims of sexual assault are not taken seriously by the justice system I mean this all took place in the early 2000s but that's not that long ago and I'm also not entirely convinced that things are that better. Louise's legacy is also really important because I'm pretty sure what it, what she kind of said in the book is it led to a sort of code of conduct being developed for police so that they don't get away with whatever they want and also she has become an advocate for uh, victims of sexual violence um, and she's really turned a horrible situation into something a lot better ultimately an inspiring story so I did rate this book four stars I found that there was a lot a lot of sort of legal discussion which went a little bit over my head that was the one thing that yeah great book recommend the next book that I read was The Graduate by Charles Webb most people I think are more familiar with their film which was based off this book also called The Graduate um, starring Dustin Hoffman it's a, a cult classic from the 1960s <laughs> basically what happens is a recent college university graduate turns home after graduating and he's completely disillusioned by life feeling empty and he starts an affair with um, one of his parents friends who is 
the age of his parents. <laughs> well, he's in his early 20s. I found this book really bizarre for some reason. The characters and the dialogue was, they, they were super frustrating and there was a lot of arguing going on constantly and things just went round and round in circles, you know? I feel like you could have cut out half of what they're talking about to get to the same point. And the characters were really erratic and I, I couldn't seem to understand what it was that they wanted from other people or from anything really. Part of me feels like this is kind of intentional because you know the whole thing is that the, the graduate, what's his name, Ben, Benjamin, he doesn't know what he wants with his life, he's empty and doesn't care about anything so you know it kind of makes sense in that way but also um, it was really aggravating to read <laughs> so I did not particularly enjoy it that much. That being said I have seen a lot of people like since reading this and reading reviews say that the movie is a lot better than the book and I can totally understand that like I can envision this sort of style working way better as a film. Yeah, that's really interesting because most of the time it's the other way around, you know? I rated it two stars. Didn't completely hate it, but found it really frustrating and annoying. And um, I am excited to see the movie because I think that will be a lot better. Next novel is How to Grow an Addict by J.A. Wright. Just a random one I picked, picked up from the library because the cover caught my eye and my golly, what a, what a, um, what a fateful moment because um, as you're about to hear I thoroughly enjoyed this. So the novel follows the life of a woman called Randall. At the start we know that she is in a drug rehabilitation centre but then it goes back and explains all the events of her life leading up to that time. So the novel is fictional but it is based off events and experiences in the author's life and I think that really comes through because it feels very authentic. As I was reading it I felt a lot of empathy for the main character Randall and it was really hard to read. Um, all the knockbacks in her life, all the terrible people around her and all the horrible things that happen. The thing that I like most about this novel is it really frames addiction as a mental health issue rather than like a criminal issue which is something I feel pretty strongly about. Addiction is a mental health issue. You know people don't just decide to become drug addicts and ruin their lives. That's ridiculous. It's usually linked to other mental illnesses or um, you know trauma or certain life situations or even just like a series of bad decisions that someone makes because you've got bad role models or because you know teenagers make bad decisions. Um, any teenager can make a bad decision that leads to something a lot worse, you know? And it doesn't make you a bad person or a criminal or whatever. I also liked that the story was ultimately hopeful as Randall kind of um, reconnects with the people in her life that are not completely toxic because there's some people in the story who are just um, not good and you don't want to, you don't want to associate with them. But there's also like family members who are not perfect either. They're also um, victims of their circumstances, possibly dealing with addiction in different ways, less um, overt ways. And I think it came through that her recovery kind of helped them to become better as well and kind of reflect on their own sort of pitfalls. 
basically this book was super engaging and made me feel a whole lot of things <laughs> so giving it five stars so the final book that I read is not a book well it is in the form of a book but it is a play called You Got Older by Claire Barron I actually read this on Scribed Scribed? Scribed? Whatever it's called and it was an assigned reading for my playwriting class. This play is about a woman called May, who I believe is in her early 30s, maybe late 20s, I think, early 30s though. And she returns home to her father because he's been diagnosed with cancer and he's going through treatment. Normally, normally I love a good um, dysfunctional family sort of drama, but this one was just like, Mm. felt very much to me like this is a stereotypical dysfunctional family drama here you go there's nothing different or special about it and there were elements that were like different and surreal but I just didn't really care for them didn't really see what the purpose was maybe I just didn't understand it that's highly probable I'm sure this is meant to be a very good play but nothing was particularly engaging to me about it. Something weird about it that I did enjoy was that some of the stage <laughs> directions were like oddly specific and things that could not be realized in a way that would be obvious to the audience. Like, for example, here's um, one of the stage directions. May thinks about Damien who she fucked without a condom and even though she didn't want to fuck him without a condom and how she put her legs over his shoulder his legs over her no his shoulders her legs over his shoulders which I've seen people um, in reviews say that that was stupid and they hated it but I actually kind of liked it I thought <laughs> as an actor that would be like fun to play with even though it's obviously not going to be obvious to the audience what you're thinking like there's no way they're gonna get there but I don't know I, I kind of like stylistic stage directions sometimes just when you're reading the play for enjoyment <laughs> ultimately I didn't find the play very engaging or uh, amusing or thought-provoking or uh, emotionally provoking didn't feel like I saw any poignant sort of change in any of the characters so yeah give it three stars so that is all the books that I read in January March, no, <laughs> January, February and March. Pretty pretty good chunk of reading there. I'm well on my way to 50 books, which is what I want to read this year. And I've already, um, since I've been in isolation, been chowing down on the books. Hopefully I will do another video like this for April, May and June. Yes, thank you very much for watching. Like I said before, if you're interested in this sort of thing, please feel free to give this a like and um, give me a subscribe. No pressure though, just, you know, if that's what you want to do. Either way, thanks for stopping in and I'll see you later.